Welcome to Retrograde Amnesia, a comprehensive podcast series where we talk about Xenogears until we are physically unable to talk about Xenogears. My name is Chris Stone, and I'm joined by Eric Lehman. Hey. Hi, I'm Eric Lehman. Hey, it's good to see you again. Thanks for coming to my basement. I appreciate it. Uh, we are on to Chapter 2 of this game, The Mountain Path. When we last left off, our hero, Fei Fong Wong, was going to pick up some shit for a wedding. For his friend Alice and Timothy's wedding. Yes, his his yes, exactly. Where does he need to go? He needs to go to up this mountain path to prof- is he is, is, is Saito Nuzuki a professor? He's is a doctor. A, a doctor? A doctor. Yeah. A doctor. I don't know how doctors are granted in this world, but he's got one. Is he one of those doctors who just takes care of the people in the local village but isn't professionally I mean, licensed? He's got like some scientist shit up there too. Well, yeah, we'll get to that. There he's got some shit going on. Yeah. So anyway, phase off to visit Dr. Saito Nuzuki in order to get some what, what was it? Cameras and lighting yeah, gear? For yeah, the, just for, some, for some, some technical aspects to help out with the production of the wedding. So we hop out to the world map and skip over to the mountain path and it's silent. Yeah. Right? There's bird noises in the background and that's it. I, I don't recall a lot about how the music was placed in this game from my first playthrough 20 years ago, but is that common in this I game? I don't think so. I, I want to say that same track of just bird noises happens occasionally, but even the next environment of this, which is a forest, there's a gloomy and dark tracks for that. I don't think, uh, maybe in the sewers there's no music, Yeah, but I think it is a very careful choice to like make it calm and as serene as possible for as long as this game can before it melts down in the, on, in the upcoming chapters. It's a pretty bland map. It's nothing, it's essentially just an introductory dungeon. I think it's a single screen, isn't it? Like it doesn't yeah. ever cut to go anywhere else it's a pretty kind of simple screen yeah and it, it, you're right it is really simple and it got me back it took me a minute but it got me back into the headspace of how things were in the 90s and earlier jrpgs were this not gonna fucking tell me where to go no uh, i just it's not really it obvious out. either it, and that that's especially pronounced with the fact that this is not a set perspective on the map it's rotatable so it's e- i mean there's a compass but it's easy to get lost there's no mm-hmm. mini map there's no direction of where to go there's a sign that tells you aren't but, there some hops floating around that kind of sh- oh no that's and that's in the forest later never mind yeah it doesn't really tell you where to go you just kind of have to figure it out and with it all being sort of bland and homogenous it's uh, it, it took me a while to you can't see, calibrate you can't see distance either you can only see what's immediately yeah, around you the way the camera's positioned it's weird and it makes me you know i've all i've heard people say that they would love for this game to be to be remade and i'm like i don't know if we really want that but yeah if traversing the environments was a little bit more entertaining a little bit more fun less less painstaking then i think we may be in a place where this game is a lot more timeless than it i mean if you want fun entertainment you know what this game has that no other rpg i've played in that era had a jump button (sighs) yeah the jump button we are introduced to the platforming pretty quickly because you go up the uh, a mountain and there is a kid there that's like hey Faye, i can't make this jump but you sure can make this jump if you Mm -hmm. press triangle and you better be aligned properly or you're gonna fucking fall back you better get that running start yeah it's not great. It's a big part. And then we know it's, it's the platforming is a big part of this game. Yeah. And Tower Babel, what's up? It doesn't make the game better. Now, I can see what they were going for, but like the collision detection, like the the area where you can land and be safe isn't as generous as it should be. You can tell that they tried to add verticality and because like making polygons elevate and stuff like that, you know, otherwise you're going to do that fallout Bethesda thing where you kind of like vertically move up mountains too yeah, fast. Stop. Yeah. You, you don't want that in your game. That's so, a good point. The the verticality they achieve is not it's bad. Impressive. It's pretty nice. And it, it's different because we're used to sort of just square maps connected with corridors. Yeah. Essentially, like cleverly you know? disguised hallways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Clever. Yeah, exactly. And this, this is not that. So there, there is something to be, to be said that where it's part of the gameplay to figure out where to go. Mm-hmm. But we're talking PlayStation One style rotating polygonal backgrounds. Yeah, they we're can't not be talking, that big This either. is not Breath of the Wild, where charting the map and, and following a path is well implemented. We're 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 a long way from Breath of the Wild, I guess I should say. And it's not like Mario sixty four, where the environments are huge. These are all pretty self contained, separated yeah. by loading screens in most cases. This is essentially the first time that we're forced to interact with the battle system. Mm-hmm. Traditional JRPGs force random encounters with enemies. Right. Uh, as we, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know that, but it's back in this game. The, it feels the, like it has a high encounter rate. It's a very high, a high encounter rate. And there was this, there's this thing in my mind uh, that I remember from playing the game years ago where occasionally I, I felt like I would just be standing still and I would be rotating the camera and I would still hit a, and mm-hmm. I would still hit a random battle just by holding down the shoulder buttons to rotate yeah. the camera. 
I don't know if that actually happens. But I think it does. Like yeah. you can hear the music start to fade out a little bit and you can know it's coming. I remember trying to hit the start button so I could beat the random yeah. encounter, which I think works sometimes. But it's got a, as far as its intro to the battle music, it has a, like a really good like three note dun 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 and yeah. then the screen blows apart in a really cool glass shattering effect. And it's a pretty quick transition. Like, it's not like Final Fantasy VII where everybody has to, like, do their battle pose and load the polygons in. Like, yeah. Faye's in there and doing his battle stance and, real and, quick. And for as much flack as we've given the game thus far with, with how it's aged and how it looks, I love the way the battle system yeah, looks. It's it clear looks and concise. Great. The, the sprites are animated. They're pretty lush. They're as pretty be- detailed. Yeah, as, as best as they, as they are in the entire game. Yeah, they're not static. They all have kind of jumping action motion, a couple of different moves. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. And there is a, it gives a sense of... I don't think it plays much mechanics, but it, it does give a sense of distance with between Faye and the enemies where he yeah. has to like jump across cliffs. And mm-hmm. if they're too far away, they won't attack you. Exactly. And I, I guess it all, I guess there's, a, there's maybe the, I guess you could perceive it as a two or three hex grid where yeah. you kind of have to move, move back and forth. I never thought of that, but that the, makes sense. The, the, the player characters, I don't believe actually have to adhere to that. Like once you click attack, you are in front of the care, uh, in front of the enemy attacking but the enemies themselves may have to move yeah i think closer. you can attack anyone wherever they are unless that changes later and i, I love everything about the 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 on foot battle system yeah what is the battle system um it is a combo system where you can use one of three of the face buttons to initiate a combo based on your action points and you start with three action points so essentially you can do triangle 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 which is each what one action each is point. one yeah and you, you can use different combinations squares of that. two x is three ultimately that will unlock combos and whatnot but i don't we're not we're we're still a little bit away from where you can actually learn death blows i think yeah i think you can learn your first one at like level five or level six yeah um, but death blows are basically like predetermined combos like i think Faye's first one is uh triangle x yeah and once you use that combination enough and once Faye is at a proper level it'll turn into like its own special move that kind of does more damage than just a regular triangle x combination would be and i haven't unlo- unlocked any uh myself on my playthrough yet but if i recall correctly those are pretty cool yeah in terms of the way they're animated they have unique they're animations animated. they're really they look neat like i don't know like what the logic is between Faye doing karate on wolves and then the fucking forest yeah it um, <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. One of the first things I wrote down for the for the mountain path chapter was we're fighting hobgoblins and jackals yeah. because that's what the enemies are called in this yeah. area. And getting that meat, <laughs> that hob meat. There, there's a lot of things about the battle, the 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 on foot battle system in Xenogears that aren't contextualized. And I think this is true with even with Final Fantasy games. The fact that there are monsters just wandering around the forest and attacking people that are walking through is never really contextualized in the grand scope of that world. Yeah, like it doesn't seem to play into the overall economy of the world i, I know that I, th- I think there's no witcher here there was some character random npc in lion village that maybe did mention that it's too dangerous to go through the black moon forest because mm-hmm. of all the monsters but all in all it's just it's just weird also as i mentioned i think in the last episode we don't know that Faye's a martial artist a really good martial artist until you get into your first battle until he's beating the shit out of a jackal yeah and he's, he's got a good pose he has an yeah. excellent sidekick yeah. he's got a good spinning backhand he's got good voices you know yeah. he's got oh, a, yeah yeah his, his, his voice sounds great the all, all the, the whole battle system just sounds wonderful yeah it's a fun system to play around with and watch like i i wish that there had been more games that had iter- iterated upon this this yeah, battle system cross kind of a little bit yeah chrono cross did but it, it did but it was more efficient Chrono Cross was more efficient, but it didn't look and sound as good as no, this one. No, yeah, Polygon's robbed it of that. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're going through the mountain. It's, like you said, it's one screen, and we when we get to the top of the mountain, uh, we get Can we get talk about to... Hob Jerky for a second? Yeah, let's talk about Hob Jerky. Hob Jerky is one of the one of the drops. It is your main health pickup. Yeah. But you can only use it in the field. You can't use it in battle to restore 50 points of health, which is a weird, kind of like, doesn't really make sense or have any reason to make sense when you're playing that game especially when you're younger it's like well it heals me like it, it never tells you it only works out in the field you just try to use an item in battle and it's not available yeah that's true only aquasols are available because those are what's sold at stores maybe aquasols have some sort of magic or, or ether to them where you can press a button and they magically heal you mm. whereas hog mm. jerky you have to fucking eat it you have to digest yeah. it and you can't yeah. do that while you're uppercutting wolves yeah. uppercutting wolves I don't know if we're doing podcast titles but uppercutting wolves yeah it's, it's a good one um so we, we get to the top of the mountain. We know that Saiten Izuki lives here with his family. It transitions to his uh, humble abode, which I like this a lot. It looks like a hastily assembled junk house. Yeah, I like it a lot because you can sort of, I don't, I don't know what you did, but 
when I walked in, I wandered in, I wandered around the back and he's got chickens mm -hmm. and you see the chickens and you can, and they give these very, they gobble like chickens do, but yes, it's some good Foley work. Uh, there's also a fucking, uh, steampunk helicopter. Yeah. Uh, my first note is dude, there's a quadruped helicopter thing out back. Yeah. And this is, I, I think the contrast of the chickens and the steampunk helicopter is a nice touch. <laughs> yeah. You get an idea yeah. of, of so his of, hobbies, of who this guy is, or who this guy might be. It's like, huh, farmer um, scientist. All right, yeah. cool. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm down with with all of the vibes that uh, Sight Nuzuki is is giving off at this point. Did you go in his workshop out back first, or did you go in his house? I went in his workshop out back, and you can't do it. it there's no, like a there's a thing there, and if you look at it, you can read the note that's written on it. Oh no, I didn't see that. The note says something like "to my dear one" or "to my loved one" or something like oh, that. Okay. I think he rereads the same note later. Okay, out loud. So you go into the house and you meet his wife, Yui. Yes. She's sad looking. She's got a portrait. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned, we established last, last episode that if you've got a portrait, you might be important. Yeah. Um, Yui's Does this is kid Midori have a portrait. Midori has a portrait as okay. well, which we'll get to Midori later. I, I didn't, I didn't talk to Midori until the end of the scene. So I don't know if you can find the kid or not. Did you find her ring? No. It's out in the flower garden. I picked it up. It never gave me a chance to give it back to her. Oh, so. interesting. Didn't know that. Did you talk to Yui? I did. She essentially just says that Saiten's working on his shit in the backyard. No, she says, my husband is tinkering with this junk out in the backyard. Tinkering with his junk. Come on, man. Oh, oh shit. Okay. That one. Oh. <laughs> like the writers are having some fun in, in, in the horniness of La Alahan village and its adjacent territory out here. Yeah. Or the um, localization team, at least. Maybe we should start implementing a horniness indicator for each yeah, chapter. Yeah, definitely. Um, so far... Chapter one's winning. But, yeah, it is, uh, it is majority horny. Yeah. So we go to see, Faye goes to see Saiten in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Some shit blows up. Saiten is muttering to himself, though. Do you hear what he says? Yes. He's muttering as something blew First, there's an explosion. He's on top of the, the workshop. Yeah, uh, is his shed. Apparently working on this on this helicopter thing, which he indicates is a, called a land crab. Yes. Uh, he's trying to fix this thing, but he also mutters something about an intervention strategy. Yeah. I don't know I how to read that quoted too. Yeah. I don't know how to read that. I don't know. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's just more techno babble with, you know, this I mean, wire didn't fit here. Or is he talking about how this land crab was implemented in, you know, in war or, or you whatever. worked on stuff, trying to repair it for like three hours and the shit's not working. And you start talking to yourself. Like, yeah. I think that's a reflection of that, that where his, there's a lot on, on Saiten's mind. We're not all privy to at the moment, but he's, he's, he's thinking about a lot all the time while trying to repair a land crab. Yeah. There's, there's something going on with, with Saiten. I think we should mention that Saiten is 29 years old. Is he really? He's an old man. He is an old man in, in, uh, in JRPG years. Quite wise, though. So he then asked Faye to go check out what's in the shed, yeah, right? The thing that we, we you could have looked at earlier, but with no context. Right. So what's in the shed? Faye goes into the shed and opens the box that we saw, and a, there's a statue. Almost lawn, like, almost it's like a lawn a, ornament. Almost like a bust of an angel. Yeah, okay. A statue of an angel. And then a sweet little music box rave starts because mm -hmm. the thing opens up and there's a bunch of, of effects uh, yeah effects for for lack of a better term i'm searching for the term of what that is and effects is the only thing i can I, confection I can party yeah maybe some sort of uh synthetic cherry petals are floating through the sky and there's a basically a music box tune humming to uh as this angel rotates around now face starts to feel some weird shit do you know what, what Sidon says Saiten, this is the part where where where, where Saiten first. <laughs> there's a lot of on the nose thing that Saiten is is. is I didn't going pick up her. any of this my first time playing this. Neither game. did I. I. I had no memory of this uh, of this scene at all. My first time playing, all I remembered was just going to see Saiten and then going back to the village. That's all I really remembered here. Yeah. How, how did the did you did you note how the music makes Faye feel? Yes. Yeah, so Saiten says music can awaken some things in Faye. You've got someone living inside you that yes. likes the music. He straight up tells Faye there's a person living inside of him that liked that music long ago. I guess you could read this as, as a, as Saiten is a believer in reincarnation. Yeah. Like um, that's what I thought maybe at that time. I was like, well, this crazy old wizard up here has got some, got some ideas. Yeah. I just think it's a nice tune. Yeah. It's quite on the nose. So he, I guess he asked Faye at that point, is he asked Faye anything else to say about this, this music box before Faye leaves? Not before he leaves. So Faye leaves and then. <laughs> The statue melts. Yeah. Kind of shatters, melts, just <laughs> and, breaks. Uh, and Saiten starts talking to himself. First, he wonders if he should, quote, live an ordinary life as a son of man, which is a, a precarious thing to say. Yeah, son of man's got some, some connotations to it. Yeah, I mean, I've often wondered. 
if I should live an ordinary life, which I do live an ordinary life, but I wouldn't call it an ordinary life as a son of man. I'm just living. Dude, if you're in your basement at 10 o'clock on a Monday talking about Xenogears, you're not living this. Come on. I guess you're right. I'm not living an ordinary life. I'm only living in an ordinary life as a son of man. At this there point, you go. That's it. Then, then, then that's when the angel melts and in sight and wonders if this is an omen. Yeah. He, uh, he literally says, is this an omen? I, I guess. Leaving no subtext available. <laughs> I guess Sighton wants us to know that this is an omen of some sort. Can we talk about how comforting the present of Sighton is as a role-playing game? Like, it reminded me a lot of Orin in Final Fantasy X, yeah. where you're kind of like this young whippersnapper, but here's a dude who knows what the fuck's happening, and is, like, here to take care of me and be, like, you know, a more established person in this world that can uh, provide a source of confidence yeah. for my young RPG player ass. He's also here to uh, to to help you, to help dump lore. When, oh yeah, when when, yeah. when needed, I'm, I think we'll get that later. Sidon knows more than anyone on the map at all. At yeah. almost every yeah. every given point, he invites Faye to dinner. Night falls, and Faye is dismissed from dinner. And they're Sidon's like, oh, "I'll just bring the shit tomorrow." Yeah, I just don't worry about it. It's night. It's dark. I also have one last note that Sidon has on top of his his house. I threw away uh, a massive telescope on top of my dude's cartoon junk house. Yeah, my dude's cartoon junk house. Yeah, that, it sort of reminded me of a uh, a Zelda or a Wind Waker esque sort of structure. Yeah, it's like fancy. Yeah, yeah. The the, the that that old tinker up there, that he's, old hermit. He's like staring at the sky. God knows what the hell he's looking for. Planes aren't invented yet. Then we we're on to chapter three, fallen shadows, and after dinner. Faye's on his way back, and giant fucking robots are flying through the sky. Yeah, he has to walk back through the mountaintop path, but it's night and there's no encounters, right? Yeah, there's no encounters, and I think the reason for that is because it's time for a fucking mood. Yeah. Because as the robots fly across the top of the... Flying robots. No fly- wings, just just flying no, robots. just, you know, five robots they're, flying through. Yeah, they got jet engines. Uh, we know they have engines. Oh, yeah, we do. Buy so many of those stupid things. So as the robots are flying over the mountain path it appears they're they're heading to uh to to, to lahan village and the this is the first time we hear the track night of fire which i think correct me if i'm wrong and maybe i haven't heard uh some, some of the music in this game in a while but this is the best tone setting music in this game i think i think so it's the most high energy track because it's also the boss fight music so you know shit's about like it creates the impression that like right now shit is about to go down yeah. The, and for the rest of the game, shit's about to go down. This scene wouldn't age well at all if, if, if not for this track. That's a lot of the game. Well, yeah, that's true. So let's take a listen real quick. So that track is awesome, but uh, ever since we started talking about doing this podcast, it reignited the mystery to me. There's a voice sample that you heard at the very end of that track. And one of the internet's like greatest subtle mysteries is what the hell are people saying in that oh, track? Oh, wow. Yeah, I never thought about it. And there's all kinds of like guesses people have had forever it's just one of those things like not a big mystery but something's in the back of your mind like what is this i looked that up recently when doing research for this podcast and someone found out one the exact same sample is played in command and conquer renegade Wow. Which is the PlayStation 2, I think, first person shooter command and conquer. It's one of the offshoots, I think. I don't know exactly what the game type is. Yeah, what the lineage there is. But it's still like not quite audible. And then on the Xenogears live concert, they played this and that one live. And they found out that it was saying total sentence imposed is 10 years. Total 
So someone looks up what that means. Some, I don't know how, because the internet exists. They found out in 1990, Christian Brando, Marlon Brando's son, murdered his sister's fiance. And that was audio recorded from the judge at his hearing saying total sentence imposed is 10 years. That audio was lost forever. In 2004, a PBS documentary on that came out that included that audio, which is how they found it again. Total sentence imposed is 10 years in the state prison. Wow. So yeah, God knows why, how in the world that sample made it into Zeno Gears, but there it is. Sounds cool. It does sound cool. I've never actually thought about it. I thought, I thought it was just random gibberish, but uh, no, okay. It, total sentence imposed is 10 I years. Would, uh, I would love an oral history of that, but yeah. uh, until that exists, this is the only oral history that exists. Someone though. has asked Mitsuda about that, and he just said it was gibberish. Oh, okay. Well, God bless the internet. Yep. Yeah. At this point, you Faye runs back to uh, to Talahan Village. Fly, the, the village is on fire. Yeah, there's some neat wavy texture warping effects yeah. going on. Yeah, and... He finds Timothy and Alice. Timothy can't leave Dan behind for some fucking reason. I don't know why, because it appears that if he would leave Dan behind, many of his problems would be solved. Just in life. Uh, But, you know, Timothy's a good dude. He wants to preserve life. But uh, Saiten and Faye both decide that they are going to be the ones to go look for Dan. I expected there to be a little bit of a moment here where you would have to go run around the town and have a couple of on-foot encounters against some, like, soldiers or something. Yeah. But that doesn't come. I don't know why. I guess it it just... it's on the cards here. Is it presumed who's attacking Ave or Kislev? Oh, good point. Saiten says that it, they look like Kislev gears. Okay. So we're assuming that Kislev is is the one behind this attack. We don't know why. We also don't know why there's a giant black robot that is the same one that's on the front of the game. Yeah. Which we will later come to. From the prologue, too. Yeah, and from the prologue. Do we know... When do we actually get the name of this gear? Think it's not in that initial. Oh, yeah, I think it's later. Okay, I was I wondering if it was in the, later. I was wondering if it was in the initiation sequence that that's about to occur, but I, I don't recall. Seeing I don't it. recall either. It could be, but I remember seeing it specifically in the forest. This scene is weird, and I'm not quite sure how you read it, but I, I the read anime it. that's coming up, or this scene. Well, before the anime, yeah, the, the anime that comes up where the the cross the swinging pendulum tangent. swings back and mm-hmm. forth. And we're starting to get the the seeds of an anime freak out are being planted here. Yeah. Uh, and what I mean by anime freak out is that someone's about to scream and some powers are about to be unleashed mm-hmm. and some crazy shit's about some to happen. Some hallucinations. Yeah. The things that happen in anime at this at, at this point in time in many games. Faye sees a creepy kid in the robot that kind of looks like Faye. He's got the same yeah. clothes. He's got no eyes. No eyes or his smile. hair is like obscuring his eyes. It's, it's tough to tell what's yeah. supposed to be depicted there. I think he's supposed to be an apparition of some sort. But he's he's piloting the gear, isn't he? I don't know. Okay. Because I read it as him being in the gear, kind of like doing it. He's, he does like the creepy laugh thing, which is, I'm sure, another trope that you can pull out of somewhere. But it's a very short anime cutscene. It's just a couple of seconds. Yeah, it, it's very strange. But then after that, Faye starts to climb into the robot. Yeah, I, I have Faye gets in the gear. Saiten, says, Saiten thinks it's capital letters very bad. How do you read that particular section? Because... Is he conscious when he's doing this? Or no. is this in the middle of his, his freak out? Is he going? You know, it's all right. He's already hysterical. And I think um, due to uh, anime logic, this taps into latent memories that perhaps there's some hypno programming that has been happening with Faye in the past that makes getting into gear the protective response he has to this hysterical situation. He, yeah, because he's not running. He's not. This is not like a, a blind charge to try to rescue everybody. He just kind of slowly just kind of jumps up in the mech and mm. then is there. Did you read the stuff on the screen when he got in the mech? Yeah, when he gets in the mech, there's an initialization, initialization section where he where there's a bunch of gibberish on the screen and then it converts the language. Yeah. And then I tried to write down as much of that as possible, but I didn't really get anything of substance. I got some of it. It, it IDs phase as a lamb with an Ignis dialect. It says it starts on like some kind of beginner mode when it realizes he's not familiar with the machine. And it's going through initialization stuff, but somebody opens fire on Faye and it stops and gives him control. That's what I had. On That's that. where we sort of get to the battle tutorial section, right? Yeah. We're, we're back to where we started with that scene. Yeah, the opening at, scene. Yeah, the opening scene with the battle going on. But Faye's in the robot. We don't really understand quite how he got there, but this is definitely very, it evokes the original Gundam quite a bit because I, I don't know if, if you can trace the trope back to Gundam, but the, the trope of a pilot stumbling into a cockpit of a giant robot and then becoming the hero is very alive and well in this game. That happens with Amaro Ray and Gundam. He just happened to have found the manual about five minutes before he, fi- he, he falls into the cockpit, mm-hmm. kind of stumbles around and, and is able to defeat a couple of Zakus just because the robot is a lot stronger than the the, ar- the armor plating on the robot is a lot stronger than the than his adversaries. Get but we also 
Yeah, getting the fucking robot. Getting the robot kid. Shinji. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. th- th- that's exactly where I was going with that. Shinji is forced into the Evangelion in a in Neon Genesis Evangelion in a similar way to where he is told that he's the one that has to pilot this and he's res- resistant to it. Yet he's able to overcome that first battle because of all the fucking shit that goes on in Evangelion that we will not get into. This is not an Evangelion podcast. <laughs> not yet. And we uh, see the Gears battle interface is different than on foot. It has different options. Like it's kind of similar where you're burning fuel from an engine to make your attacks. Yeah, but there's no combos. Yeah, not yet. It's a very, it's a rudimentary interpreter. It's just saying like, hey, this is going to be different. Uh, you're in a giant robot and more powerful now. Yes. And if you press X, you can do a roundhouse kick because apparently. It's very limber. It's very limber, and I, I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but it appears to map towards Faye's own martial arts abilities. Yeah, I didn't pick that up. Good call. Not sure if that's just the nature of the robot or if that it actually is, if, or if we're looking at a Pacific Rim situation where you're sort of syncing up with your with your robot itself. So Faye's beating ass, and then it pans out to a robot that doesn't look like the robots that he's beating up. Yeah, there's a, some sort of commander robot yeah. with an X shape across his back, or its back. Did you um, see that as commander or observer in the distance? I saw it as a commander because there's one moment when it sort of clenches its fist and points when it's telling him to mow down the villagers. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. I didn't pick that up. There's a couple of things after, after Faye runs into battle against the other gears. Saiten quips that if he awakens he. here. Yeah. Quotation uh, works. He. Yeah. So Saiten, very early on, we know that Saiten knows what's up with this shit. Saiten is afraid that he might awaken if Faye continues to fight and begs him to stop. And... Who shows up? Who shows up? Dan. Oh, Dan. Yeah, Dan does show up. Saiten finds Dan, right? Yeah, Dan's come back to get Alice's wedding dress. Sweet boy. What a what sweet a, what boy. What a nice thinking of his sister. Dan can't believe that Faye is in that monster. And, and Dan continues to refer to the Welltall as that monster. That monster. I have a quotation here. I don't remember who said it. I think it's Saiten, but it just says, quote, Faye is bound to the dark cruelty of it, the dark, the dark cruel destiny of a god. Yes, he says that to Dan. <laughs> okay, so he's trying uh, to explain to Dan what the fuck Faye's doing up yeah. in this giant robot. He doesn't say Faye got in this robot and he's trying to protect us. He says, he <laughs> he says, says yeah. Faye is bound by the dark, cruel destiny of a god, Dan. Just, Just don't worry about happen. it, Dan. He's bound by the cruel destiny. Okay, Dan? <laughs> it's cruel destiny. Just don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, it's quite on the nose there. Sighton so nice. again. Sighton has already struck like four or five times already in the, in the 30 minutes that we've known him at this point. Do you have anything else before the next anime? We mentioned the commander gear mows down, asks the other gears to mow down the remaining villagers. Yeah. That's when the animation kicks in. And the animation here looks pretty good. I it's think. all right. It's the um, voices are off, but. Yeah, the voices are kind of bad, but the uh, stylistically, it differs slightly from the sprites because the characters are leaner and they have a very mid 90s anime OVA style. Yeah, They're not burly. Yeah, they're not burly, nor, nor are they. They're well proportioned. Yeah. yeah it reminds no me of SD it, stuff. It, it, I probably will reference Gundam a lot during this. And I know you haven't you've seen no Gundam, right? Zero. It reminds me slightly of some of the art styles in some of the Gundam OVAs in the, the eighth mobile suit team and the um, 0080 war in the pocket where the characters don't look like stereotypical anime characters. They look more well proportioned and uh, more like humans. And and that's the style that comes along here. And I, I like it a lot. I mean, it makes me wish there was more of it. But that's essentially when we get to the point of the full anime freak out. Yeah. Well, what happens to make Faye freak out? The cross. The cross happened, but somebody gets murked. Somebody comes back in town looking for Dan. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Timothy gets shot to pieces. It's pretty brutal, too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's kind of, I was like, whoa, this is teen rated. Like, there, there are bullets entering his skin and popping out the other side. He get he's like, it's not those things where like, oh, well, he'll probably be okay when sight and pat. No, he gets annihilated. This causes Faye to kind of lose his mind and then vaporizes the entire town. Is that suggested or does it show it? It shows a bunch of purple beams of energy emitted from emitting from the well tall as mm-hmm. he freaks out in sort of this Super Saiyan esque explosion of energy just shooting out everywhere. Uh, it's very in line with, with with the way anime works at this time. You know, if you uh, pilot a newbie rock for the first time, you're surely going to have a hidden power that's going to come out and solve the situation well, in a way that's not going as you intended. If you're a kid who falls into the cockpit of a giant robot and you're going through some emotional 
mental trauma. It's a rough day. You're going to have a bad time inside this robot, but you're also going to unlock the robot's abilities. Right. That's And learn more about yourself along the way. All it costs is the lives of hundreds of innocents. That's pretty much what happens here. It's not great for Faye. Everything <laughs> is fucked. Um, not great, Faye. No, it's not great. It, it, that's the point when we, when we cut to the aftermath, right? Yeah, he wakes up in a field. Dan is upset. Dan's very upset. There's, it appears there's only a handful of yeah, villagers alive. A, little bit, a couple of maids. I think Chief Lee made it. Also, in between this podcast and the last one, I developed a theory that all the maids are Chief Lee's daughters that he forces to work his city. You know, Chief Lee, there's some fanfics out there about Chief Lee, maybe. We'll yeah, we thought we're going to start writing it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, let's get on that. So what's uh, Dan? Like, I think Sidon talks to Dan and he's like, look, that wasn't Faye's fault. This shit was going to happen. He react and like Dan kind of comes to understand that, but is still very pissed off about the death of his sister and Timothy. Dan spe- specifically says how... Do you even know how to operate such a monster? Again, referring Valid to question. The, again, referring to the uh, the, the well tall as the is uh, the well tall in the background taking a knee during all this. It's standing upright. Okay, and as Saiten suggests that Faye leaves for the sake of the remaining villagers and yeah. in for himself, he says, "Go through the Black Moon Forest for Ave." Because if Kissel, I guess Saiten's not letting us know everything that he knows here, but he rationalizes to Faye if Kissel is looking. For you, you should go to Ave. Yeah. So then we have this shot of Faye walking away from the the villagers and the well tall, where there's this ominous. The shot kind of pans where the the well tall is kind of like peering. It's close to the camera and it's peering down at Faye as he's walking off into the distance in silence. It's a cool shot with a pretty limited set of tools to make that yeah, shot work. Yeah. There's no cutscene. It, it's like a bunch of poly and it, it's crude. It's, it's effective, crude, but, but that that one looks good. And that that was the first moment when I was like. That would be a really cool scene if this game was a modern game. A lot of, like, there's very few actual cutscenes in this game. They use a lot of character dialogue boxes, characters talking back and forth, like, long stuff. And then there's disc two, which is much different than all that entirely. Yeah. But this game needed the portraits in the oh, dialogue. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, was, it was a smart because pull from Lunar. They don't have a great, they don't have a great way to, um, to animate the characters, especially with, like, you th- think back to Final Fantasy VI, where, those sprites were extremely animated, yeah. But they were Bulging eyes. they were small and they were they were detailed to an extent, and and, and they were on like backgrounds, like everything sort of meshed well together. That kind of style holds yeah, up today. This background is kind of translucent in these the text the text dialogue boxes. You yeah, can see through them. And there's a few emotes. Like Dan has a couple e- emotes. And is his sprite? Yeah, his sprite. He does he does that weird emote where he like pulls down his underneath of his eye and sticks his tongue out a couple of times. Wow, I missed that. Yeah, and there's one I think where he laughs. But I didn't really notice anything else. I guess because you're usually you're focused on the character. Yeah, I'll pay attention to that in the future yeah. to see if there's any. I, I, I didn't even think to look at it's this no, stuff. It's nowhere near as effective as they were in, in like a Final Fantasy VI, a Chrono Trigger. Right. Or even a... Because uh, it was their only option a for expression. Mana. Yeah. And this th- this whole you know this whole moment of being ostracized from the village, I, I, I doubt there's any direct influence here. But it does remind me of the first scene in Secret of Mana after... You pull the mana, the forbidden mana sword from the waterfall and draw all the monsters onto the town and then are banished by the chief elder for violating the law. Coincident, coincidentally enough, one of the main character's friends, uh, Secret of Mana's name is Timothy, but uh, oh, wow. I'm sure that's a coincidence. Yeah. But that's it for that, uh, for that section. At, at that point, as soon as Faye walks off, it cuts to the world map music and we're on the world map. And Good world map music. And, uh, that is some good. That's, yeah. I, I think, I think that's your, if you didn't leave the town earlier, that's your first introduction to the world map music. You get it briefly when you travel to the mountain path. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Didn't so know that. that's, that, that, that's your second time, but it, it is sort of the first time that you were. It's a short hike to the woods. It's not drastically, it's not clear where the woods. I mean, there's a big, huge thing of woods on the map, but yeah. it doesn't necessarily 
tell you where the entrance is. So there's a little wandering. And I tried to wander down to the southern part of the map. And there's there's nothing there. Yeah. You can, I think there's two enemies to fight. One of them, uh, you can get some, a good fencing cap and some fencing yeah. wear, some, some upgraded armor from that. Yeah. So that's it. At that, at that point, it moves on to the, uh, to chapter five. Into the woods. Into the woods. And that'll be it for this one. Catch us next time where we will go into the woods, Eric. Nice. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. Check us out on Twitter at retroamnesia pod on Patreon at patreon.com slash retro AM. Or send us an email at retrogradeamnesiapodcast at gmail.com. And as always, thanks Mark Shepard for the intro track. It sounds great. Yes. Do we have to do our outro? Until next time. Yes, we will kill God. Mm-hmm.